Uh, we have a special guest. He's not a special guest. He's one of the family with us here this morning. And uh, so we just asked Don to come up and uh, give us the message. And uh, that through it, we'll draw closer to a man called Jesus Christ. Don? Well, it's fun to be back. It really is. I was going to say to meet old friends, but you're not old. <laughs> and also to meet uh, Ed and Rhonda, who I'd never met before. Nice to meet you. Thomas, you play very, very, very well. I really enjoy you're playing the piano. You play it with enthusiasm. You move those hymns along. They don't drag out. Right? Well done, Thomas. I enjoyed your playing the organ, too, when I came in. We don't use our organ anymore in Clarion. I miss it. I really do. Well, we're here today to talk and think about three, four verses, three verses, I guess it is, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. We'll talk about what I just handed out to you in a few minutes. I want to talk this morning about my favorite subject, and that's Jesus. Oh, you live in pretty much the same world I do, full of strife and conflict and evil, full of sin. These are the times that try men's and women's souls, aren't they? Um, a little background to this passage. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 44. Jesus' public ministry lasted about three years. He began in the fall of the year 29. It appears very much as though he was crucified on April the 3rd in the year 33. One day he was uh, on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee and he was talking, teaching, preaching. Prior to this, Jesus was more direct in how he taught and preached. For example, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is very direct about what he has to say. Well, this stirred up the Pharisees. They didn't like what he was saying and actually they began to threaten his life. And so Jesus gradually changed his strategy and began teaching more indirectly by way of parable stories. And so that's what we have to think about here today. 
I have a question for you. What is the, the one thing that means more to you than anything else? What is the one thing that means more to you than anything else? Or maybe it's not a thing, maybe it's a person. If it's a thing, maybe it's your home or your bank account or your portfolio of stocks and bonds. It could be anything. If it's a person, it might be your wife, it might be your husband, it might be your son or your daughter or your sons or your daughters. Someone, you haven't seen them for a while and then you meet up with them and you just can't wait to get your arms around them. Say, oh, I love you. You know what? That question is so personal. I'm not sure you should ask that question of anyone. It's that personal. Don't go home and ask your wife or your husband. Don't ask them that question. It's a very personal question. Well, Matthew 13, beginning at verse 44 to 46. Jana has it on the wall for us. Thank you, Jana. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus is talking, is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again? The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. We're talking here about the kingdom of heaven. I'll read it from the NIV. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden. Kingdom of heaven. Let's just define that for our purposes for the few moments ahead of us. Let's think of the kingdom of heaven as the family of God. The community of faith. And of course, ultimately, heaven. Heaven which will finally be on earth. Heaven on earth. So there's a now and there is a then to this kingdom of heaven. Let's first of all take a, a few moments to look at the, the parable of the hidden treasure. Uh, Jesus was talking to Jews on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee when he was delivering this lesson or this sermon. Jews, of course, believe, belonged to the nation of Israel. They were surrounded on all sides like they are today by powerful neighbors who weren't so neighborly. They oftentimes were enemies in the 1930s, the 1940s, Poland, west of Poland was Germany, east of Poland was the Soviet Union, we know it now as Russia. What happened to Poland in the 1930s and 40s? Well. September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And then after Germany went through and destroyed the country, Warsaw was practically leveled to the ground. It was a beautiful city. Rubble 
when the Germans got down with it. Then the Russians came along and did further damage of further damage was possible. They destroyed, they looted, they raped the women, they killed by the hundreds of thousands. Well, if you look at the handout I gave you, I hope you can make it out. <laughs> There's the Mediterranean Sea, okay, and south of the sea is the country of Egypt. And then a little bit to the northeast of Egypt is Babylon. That would be southern Iraq today. And then northern Iraq was Assyria. And these were powerful empires. Well, you also notice the Arabian Desert there. And I have arrows pointing. When Egypt was in conflict with Babylon or Assyria, Egypt moved northward. And Assyria moved southwestward. Babylon moved north and avoiding the Arabian Desert because you're not going to travel across a desert. And so we see Israel there, right? Israel gets pounded every time. These mighty armies go up and down through the little country of Israel. Well, some people would try to flee, but when you can't flee, you can't flee. You get caught in the crossfire. So what is your concern? Simply to stay alive right? To preserve your home if you possibly can. And to take care of your valuables. You have money, gold maybe, silver, jewels, jewelry. The precious items that you have that are yours, that are valuable. What are you going to do with your valuables. You're going to find a jar. That's what that's supposed to be. That's supposed to be a, jar, a clay jar. Was in Israel one time. A friend of mine who had more money than I had. Bought a number of items. A couple jars. They weren't really big. Oh, well, you know, maybe something like that. I was surprised. I would have thought, well, one of the jars came from the time of David. That jar is now 3,000 years old. I would have thought those jars probably were fairly crude. They were beautiful. Preserved. Miraculously, I suppose. The only thing missing on, uh, 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 on Ron's jars is the painting. The painting has gone away. But the jar is intact. Beautiful jars they were. So you would have a, you'd have an earthen jar. And you would take your valuables, your coins, your gold, your silver, your jewels, your jewelry, you would put those treasured items into a jar like this. And you would go out and you would dig a hole in the ground. They didn't have banks, safe deposit boxes, safes. They would bury that in the ground, cover it over, so nobody would notice that something was buried there. And wait until the enemies were through fighting one another and went back home then they could go out and dig up this jar full of treasure that they were able to preserve in this way. So here's a man, he's a peasant. He's a hired hand. 
He's hired by the landowner. He's out in the field one day working for the landowner. And lo and behold, he comes across a buried jar full of treasure. He's a peasant. He doesn't have much. So what's he do? Well, he does what you and I would do. He digs it up and he checks it out. And he looks in that jar and he finds gold, silver, coins, jewels, jewelry. And so what does he do? Well, he puts it back in the ground and he covers it up. And he goes home, probably talked with his wife about what he had just discovered. He takes whatever he has that's of value, gathers it together, takes it out, and sells it to a buyer. And he takes the money that he gets from his own treasure, and he goes to the landowner. And he buys the land, the field, where he found the buried treasure. And now, not only the field belongs to him, but most especially, the hidden treasure belongs to him. Now, before you raise your eyebrows and say, what? I want to say this. Jesus' emphasis here is not on the ethical behavior of the man. That's not Jesus' emphasis. The peasant's honesty is not the point. Indeed, the peasant's honesty is shown here. What could he have done when he discovered the treasure? Could have lifted it out of the ground, checked it out, and gone home with it, couldn't he? He didn't do that. Or he could have tried to buy the field from the landowner for a whole lot less than he knew it was going to be worth. Rabbinic law, you know the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, who were the leading teachers of the day? Rabbinic law said this, a day laborer, which is what this man was, could acquire a treasure he might find in the course of his work. That's what this man did. If he were able to stop working and then return and obtain the treasure. That's how the rabbis handled those situations. So this man was following rabbinic law. But Jesus' point is not the ethical behavior of this man. Jesus has two things in mind, I think. The great value of the treasure and the intense desire of this man to obtain it. The peasant found something he wasn't looking for. He went out that day to work in the field with no idea at all that there would be a treasure buried that he would find. What he found was of great value and he gives up all that he has to obtain the treasure. What's the treasure? Jesus is not talking about a jar full of valuables. What's Jesus really trying to convey through this parable? <coughs> the treasure of having one's sins forgiven, belonging to the family of God, be belonging to the community of faith, having in the end eternal life. That's the treasure that Jesus surely has in mind. Well, can you buy your way into the kingdom of God? Oh. No. 
<laughs> is there a price to be paid to become a part of the family of God? Is there a price to be paid for following Jesus? Oh yes, there is a price to be paid. I, different times here I've mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer the young Lutheran pastor who lived in Nazi Germany he ended up being martyred for Jesus on April the 9th 1945 obviously before he died he said this made this statement he said what cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Did your salvation, my salvation cost God anything? Cost him his son, didn't it? And Bonhoeffer says, what cost God much can't be cheap for us. Well, what will it cost us? There's a man who lived in England. His name was Isaac Watts. 311 years ago, in 1707, he wrote a hymn. You very well may have sung it over the Easter season. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, love so amazing, so divine. Do you remember the next word? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Well, then there's the parable of the pearl of great price. Uh, the pearl, I'm told, is the costliest of gems made by an oyster. Smooth, hard, usually white in color. In Jesus' day, they found them in the Red Sea or in the Persian Gulf. They knew about oysters, and they knew about pearls. They were bought by the wealthy. Women wore them how? Necklaces, right? And, and bracelets. We still do, don't we? Well, you do. <laughs> Maybe. Pearls. Beautiful. Well, here in this story, we have a pearl merchant. And he has an eye for pearls. And he's always looking for pearls of extra high quality. And one day he comes across a pearl that is very, very valuable. And he does the same thing that the peasant man did. He gathers together all the valuables that he has and he sells those and he takes the profit from that sale to buy this very valuable pearl, this very valuable gem. These two stories, the hidden treasure and the pearl, these represent the incomparable value of the kingdom of heaven. The incomparable value of having your sins forgiven. Being born in the family of God. Being part of the family of faith. Being a Christian. The incomparable value of that. And in the end, heaven 
everlasting life. Must you give up everything you have, all your money, your home, your job, your position, your reputation to be saved? Probably not. Probably not, but maybe. Bonhoeffer gave up his life. God doesn't seem to require that of all of us, does he? Probably not, but we must be willing to, if that's what God requires of us. Someone put it this way, saving faith, saving faith, hangs on to no privileges, it clings to no sin, no secret sins, it clings to no treasured possessions, human or otherwise. It is an unconditional surrender to God. It demands my soul, my life, my all. Well, what is, what is the, the pearl of great price written? And it's this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the pearl of great price written. What is the pearl of great price in person? Jesus. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Christian, your relationship with Jesus is a love relationship. <coughs> Shortly before Jesus left the earth and ascended into heaven, he had a little conversation with Peter along the shore of Galilee. And how did that conversation go? Simon, son of John, do you love me? You notice he didn't say to Peter, Peter, do you have faith in me? Do you believe in me? Do you trust me? No, it was, do you love me? Well, why? He knew if Peter loved him, Peter would have faith in him. Peter would believe in him. Peter would trust him. So I close by saying simply this. Be sure that you have Jesus. Stay close to him. Keep him in the center of your heart.